All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Cincy Library Film Club. My name is Ben Lathrop. I'm from the Information and Reference Department at the Main Library. With me is my co-host, Ann Driscoll. Hi. Uh, in addition to being part of my team at the library, Ann's an accomplished artist, performer, composer, and an active member of the Mini Micro Cinema here in town. Uh, before I was a librarian, I studied and taught film at Ohio University and worked on the Athens International Film and Video Festival. Um, and during the early days of the stay-at-home order, Ann and I kind of put our heads together to come up with an idea for a, a book club, but for movies. Um, and this is it. So just a reminder of how it works, we choose a different title from uh, the great selection of films that are available to stream for free through the library. Uh, and then we meet back here to discuss it every other Tuesday night here on Facebook Live. Yes, and this week we were looking at Roberto Rossellini's Journey to Italy, which was recommended to us by our special guest, Nick Pinkerton. Nick is a Cincinnati-born, Brooklyn-based writer and occasional programmer and educator focused on moving image-based art. His writing has appeared in Film Comment, Sight and Sound, Art Forum, Reverse Shot, The Guardian, Four Columns, The Baffler, Harper's, and The Village Voice, among other venues. Welcome, Nick. Thank you for having me, Ann. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Ben. Uh, so, Nick, you've been working, uh, we'll kind of jump straight in. Uh, you've been working as a professional film critic and have written, uh, as Anna just lifted, for pretty much every prestigious publication about the medium. You know, if such a thing can be said to exist, sure, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess my question, you know, this was all during this period where there's been this massive proliferation of venues for film critique and discussion mm. um, mm -hmm. that arguably have pretty low barriers to entry. You know, we're thinking even like Rotten Tomatoes, but generally all blogs and social media, everybody's opinion about film is, is being broadcast at all times. Um, so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts about the role of a film critic in this world where, you know, everybody's a critic. Well, I don't know that we've ever not lived in such a world like <laughs> last year um was the 20th anniversary of the release of eyes wide shut and um i had occasion to be doing some like reading up uh related to a, a podcast appearance i was supposed to do and i was reading all of these, you know, kind of local newspaper reviewers uh, write-ups of Eyes Wide Shut. These are, uh, you know, in many cases, people writing for, you know, free weeklies or uh, papers that would have long over, uh, long ago gone over to like AP writers and things like this that used to have their own film critics, just as Cincinnati had, you know, Two when I was a young man, uh, Margaret Craig McGurk. Cop at the Post and Margaret A. McGurk at the Inquirer. Um, and as I was reading these reviews of uh, Eyes Wide Shut by these many uh, arts journalists who are no longer in the business, a lot of them were total garbage. <laughs> and yeah, this is a much like bemoaned era in our media history and there are a lot of things to miss about it but at one and the same time it's not like there wasn't like a surfeit of <laughs> underqualified and shabby cultural journalism around 20 years ago sure. uh, there's probably a little more money in it but i don't know like if the altogether the quality has increased or decreased like yeah you know, i can't say with any certitude um and in some ways, it's possibly a better time for people with niche interests. Sure. And then, you know, there's always going to be a vast middle ground of mediocrity, but that's hardly something that the internet has ushered into the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've talked about how the internet, though, has kind of created this like clamorous din um, of opinions where it's sort of hard to to feel like distinguished or that you're making an impact per se in this ocean of content. Is that kind of one of the, the dynamics that you've commented on? Well, yeah, I mean, w somebody just today posted a screenshot of all these aggregated, aggregated um, screenshots from various review aggregators, i.e. Metacritic, <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes, 
showing all the like various acclaimed television shows that have been rolled out or you know whatever streaming content that's been rolled out in the last 12 months and you just see this vast undifferentiated field of like 95% fresh 98% fresh everything <clears throat> simply everything that comes down the pike and you know very often a question that'll be posed is you know, does criticism matter anymore? And if you look at something like that, in at least one area, and this is the area where most people rank and file relate to criticism, of course it doesn't matter. Like, how could that possibly be meaningful when consensuses are consistently being uh, formed on that level? Yeah. And at one and the same time, you have this system that seems to consensus build um, with insidious regularity, but you also have a ongoing process of quote unquote cultural conversation that as soon as the consensus is struck, there's a uh, debunking or a uh, stripping down of that consensus. So you have a weird sort of feeling that I find increasingly prevalent where everything is both overpraised and pilloried at the same time. Uh, and it just becomes very difficult to extract any kind of coherent narrative out of that. Um, yeah. I think in so many words, that's what I find myself talking about quite a lot with regards to what hath, uh, online cultural criticism wrought. <laughs> and again, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure it's a paradise lost situation. I mean, there are certainly things to be said about having moved away from a world where like the village voice Paz and Jop poll uh, is the arbiter of quality uh, and we have a greater like panoply of voices, but there is also a, a certain incoherency that uh, seems to come with things. Yeah, I, I definitely have have noticed those patterns that you've just described, and I appreciate how astutely you've put it, where it's the sense of, of things being overpraised and this consensus emerging, but then this backlash and this picking over things um, and sort of the meta, meta, meta commentary on everything. Um, well, I mean, there's just such a surfeit of commentary. And I mean, part of it is you have this metastatizing of what to use, you know, the old print phrase we'll call column space. There's just so much space to fill now. And initially, I mean, I think part of, not part of, I mean, really the engine driving the coinage of like the golden age of television was quality television, so-called, was just perfectly suited for the content mill because you had a new episode every week you had an abundance of opportunities to just fill virtual pages to spill virtual ink and it's a little more difficult with films of course because you know they're only a finite number that have any kind of cultural cachet whatsoever that come along so you have to find a way or many people did find a way um, as you have not only new online platforms cropping up, but you have the old print platforms creating these um, new online sections for which they suddenly have an abundance of space to fill. You have to find a way to just get more juice out of a movie. So as opposed to previously running solely your review and that is what stands for posterity in the magazine newspaper whatsoever. You have to find a way when, you know, to pluck an example out of the air, like Richard Linklater's Boyhood comes out, you run your initial review, then as it gains traction, as it becomes something of an event, you can get all kinds of, you know, you're going to find new points of entry for the thing just to like extract as much juice as humanly possible mm -hmm. from everything that comes down the line. I think because of this, it becomes diff <laughs> it becomes very difficult to know what any 
uh, you know, masthead of notes position on anything is because you have an official review that uh, puts forward something and then you have uh, 17 more takes yeah. approaching the same object from uh, left, front, and center. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all just part and parcel of this uh, great metastatizing of, you know, what is now colloquial called colloquially called content, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so just to change gears a little bit, you wrote really movingly um, recently in film comment about your experience watching films during the pandemic. Um, in that essay, you spoke about film as both a solitary and a communal activity and um, how the mm -hmm. pandemic has to some extent returned cinephilia to its roots for you as an activity cultivated in, in isolation as a kid watching, watching TV and VHS and tapes and stuff. Um, but I know that you are, you know, a huge fan of going to the cinema and believe in cinema exhibition and public cinema experience. I was wondering if you could just talk about that piece and what it's been like for you watching movies during the pandemic. Well, I mean, I think among other things, it's just driven home the degree to which for me personally, and I should predicate this by saying I enjoy a lot of opportunities by virtue of being in New York that I know not everybody does. I enjoy a lot of opportunities to see, you know, films in Archival 35 and see, you know, revivals that uh, I'm quite fortunate, or at least up until a couple of months ago, I was quite fortunate <laughs> to have access to. Um, and to me, it's just driven home something that I've always kind of known, but triply underlined the fact is just how much that theatrical experience, I won't say it's the only way, but it is in some ways, it really completes things for me. In an instance that, you know, I've had occasion to refer to more than a couple of times in the past is I used to much more frequently than I do now write about um, repertory uh, series in New York, mostly. And, you know, I'd be writing very often for, say, The Village Voice, so I'd have to write well in advance of the series. So I'd watch everything that I could on screener discs, files, you know, Vimeo, whatever. And then if it was something I was enthusiastic about, I'd go see the films themselves, or at least, you know, the ones that particularly struck my fancy. And every time at, after spending, you know, a week or more like immersed in a body of work or a program, and then going to see the films big, every time I would think to myself, like, I did not, I did not understand at all what this thing actually was. Like, I, you know, I, I fancy like most of the thing. time I was able to get the outline of it, but there is a totality in that experience that I miss a lot. And again, like I know that it's, you know, uh, an experience that unfortunately, I mean, especially for repertory titles, things like that, like, unfortunately that is a more and more difficult experience for people to have outside of like a handful of very large cities. Um, and I wish that wasn't the case. I, I was lucky to be in uh, Southwestern Ohio at a time when like uh, the real movies was still there on race street and, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to like even see like house of wax at the Emory theater and like 1997 <laughs> or to go see like Cincinnati film society, um, you know, playing uh, like uh, Bruce Connor and Warhol stuff at the old museum center. Now like channel nine WCPO to see like 16 millimeter, like Bruce Connor shorts. Like, uh, you know, I, I was very, very fortunate to have that experience. Um, and roundabout answer to your question. It just draw, it just totally drives home to me. And I'm watching, I, you know, I'm absolutely pounding films every night because there's nothing else to do <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i'm just like shredding through a half dozen pre-codes a night so in some ways i've never watched more movies but it, i i'm also like you know watching like a 480p 
like rip of a Gregory Lakava movie on a Russian website is, <laughs> you know, I'll take it, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not the ultimate, you know? Yeah. Well, so there's been lots of hand wringing, uh, I mean, for a while now, but especially since these closures about the fate of theatrical exhibition. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Like, uh, you know, theaters are worried about being able to reopen. I mean, theatrical exhibition, I, you know, I, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think that individual exhibitors, individual theaters, many of them are very much on the ropes, just as any business, and I should doubly emphasize small business, that didn't have an enormous pot set away for a rainy day and you know, frankly, most businesses don't, just like most of us don't, uh, is in real danger. Um, and that's across the board. Um, you know, Film Society, or sorry, Film at Lincoln Center, as they've recently rebranded, um, ceased the physical publication of Film Comment magazine, citing the uh, pandemic. Um, and this, you know, this is a... 40 plus year tradition that exists. Um, One has a very real sense right now that many things, even institutions that one would have regarded as being permanent are potentially believed to be expendable during this thing. All of which is to say, if every single movie theater in America closes down in the course of this when we come blinking out of our hidey holes in 2025 i imagine somebody will open a movie theater (laughs) like uh but you know i would rather that not be the case but yeah i I think it's david boardwell who said something to the effect of like you know no art form that ever came into existence on this earth has ever disappeared So I I don't (laughs) believe any more than I believe like the ballet is going away because of this or the grand opera is going away because of this. I don't believe that the theatrical cinema is going to disappear and that we'll all be like watching, what is it, Queeby? Queeby? (laughs) (laughs) Queeby (laughs) TikTok videos for Eight minute episodes. (laughs) Somehow, I, th- I think we might weather the uh, onslaught of Queeby. Yeah. Quilby. Is that a variation on, like, TikTok or Vine or something? <laughs> no, no, it's... Uh, truthfully, I don't know what I'm talking about. And I, all I know is it was, like, the big, it was the big launch. They had, like... They had, like, a dozen Super Bowl spots for this, you know, new streaming service that because, you know, we're all living such hectic uh, lives, we can only afford to, and our brains are completely destroyed uh, by the internet, we can only afford to watch like eight minutes of content at a time. So this new service (laughs) launched, and it launched just at the moment that everybody was told to like go hang out in their house for two months, like just at the moment when all need for such a thing was uh, pretty much out the window. <laughs> I have to research that. Well, so real quick, because I want to make sure we still have time to talk about the movie. Um, Earlier yeah. this year, our genealogy and local history department put together an exhibit uh, called Cinema Cincinnati. It, I, 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 I went to, to it. See it. Yeah. Um, so we were curious, you know, you'd recently uh, done a podcast where you talked about essential New York films and mm. just wondering if you had you know, is there an essential Cincinnati film or films well, for that matter? I mean, yeah, the short answer for me is always, and I think you've shown it there, is Larry Yust's Home Bodies is the high, high Cincinnati masterpiece. Um, you guys are oh, familiar? Yeah. I think That's what um, I wish it, that would be fun to dig up for this. I wonder if we could get a, a digital print. I mean, I absolutely can scrape one up. All right. We'll um, see. We'll but yeah, later. I mean, I, 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 I love that movie for a number of reasons. I mean, it it's, belongs to a category of filmmaking that I'm extremely fond of. Just real briefly for anyone who's not familiar, um, it's like the one and only 
old exploitation movie. Um, it's nursing home it massacre. Takes place, sort of, right? It takes place in an unnamed city, but it's all shot in over the Rhine, essentially. Uh, takes place in a townhouse that is populated entirely by 70-somethings and 80-somethings. Uh, great ensemble cast of really fantastic old character actors, including Ian Wolf. Um, and there, the city is going to be knocking down this townhouse to make room, not a townhouse, a medium-sized tenement building, in order to make room for a high-rise development. And the residents of the building uh, decide to stand up for their rights. And initially, this uh, takes the form of a sort of, you know, minor disobedience, but then it turns into industrial sabotage, and then the, the industrial sabotage uh, turns into a body count, uh, and the body count As starts rising and rising. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's this fantastic, and I mean, it's a wonderful movie, among other things, about, uh, you know, urban renewal, so-called, and the manner in which uh, we in these United States gutted so many of our urban cores and stripped them of their uh, character and uh, robbed ourselves of many of the like greatest civic treasures that we have. Um, but it's also very funny, um, and it's just like a wonderful document of what, you know, over the Rhine, North Liberties, like what that area looked like in the early 1970s. There's like a little bit of footage from like Bunker Hill area, Los Angeles cheated in, but like 95%. <laughs> And it also it, it 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 has this long protracted chase at the end, which includes like a paddle boat chase through the like uh, lake in Burnett Woods. And it's like a paddle boat chase, and all the participants in the chase are about like ninety years old, so it's just super slow moving. It's very funny. Excellent. That sounds singular. Yes, home home bodies. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely rocks. Are, I I don't think we'll be able to top that frankly so um you know moving on we want to make sure that we can get plenty of time tonight we're talking about roberto rossellini's 1954 film journey to italy uh which was an icy portrayal of a failing marriage set against the backdrop of popular tourist destinations in italy uh, the film stars george sanders and ingrid bergman who were both well-known movie stars at the time um, but watching it today it really feels different from hollywood dramas particularly that era uh, so, Nick, I was hoping you could give us kind of a crash course in post war um, What was going on and where does Journey to Italy fit in? Well, you have in the immediate post-war period this incredible ferment of filmmaking activity that's kind of grouped together under the... Uh, the designation Italian neorealism. Um, and certainly Rossellini is right in the middle of that. Um, but by the time of Journey to Italy, it's considered by some that he has kind of betrayed the movement this very loosely defined movement that he's you know, thought to have helped to found. Um, so. And, and that's Rossellini, just, Oh, go ahead. That's because like, so neorealism, the big sort of betrayal that he did was sort of like adding like movie stars basically. And but I mean, but of staying course, away from the, but the, but that's, I mean, even in Rome open city, which is the kind of opening salvo of Rossellini's very distinct post-war career. And he, you know, he had been a filmmaker, an active filmmaker prior to, or rather during the fascist period, um, but has a you know, very definite kind of pivot point moment with Rome Open City. But it's, you know, it's got movie stars in it. Um, a lot of the 
Well, I should say this. I mean, there were absolutely theoreticians of a neorealist style, like Cesar Zavattini, uh, people like this. Um, but that was never entirely Rossellini's bag. And yeah. his definition of neorealism would be very different from uh, De Sica's definition of neorealism. And even at that like foundational moment, even in uh, Rome Open City, a lot of what came to be the foundational mythology of neorealism is exactly that. I mean, it was, you know, the thing that distinguished this to viewers both in Italy and abroad is the fact that it's very rough edged, uh, the fact that it's shooting on location very often, but not all the time that it's very often used, but it's using movie stars too. Yeah. So, I mean, even from that moment, there's a basic, uh, contamination of any sort of pure neorealist yeah. uh, aesthetic, which was not, you know, ever exactly Rossellini's bag. And this then idealized style that, you yeah, know, yeah. And 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 by the time you reach the early 1950s, certainly in Italy, he always had very uh, vocal champions in France, um, but he was very heavily criticized during this period of his career as having, you know, turned his back on his, you know, having betrayed his gifts, essentially. Like Rossellini hooking up with Bergman and moving in a maybe more expressionistic direction than the immediate post-war movies, you know, uh, Germany, Year Zero, and Paisan, um, and uh, Rome Open City. This this second pivot, which was not the last of Rossellini's career, he's, I won't say totally singular, but nearly unique among directors in how many movements his career has. <laughs> Anyways, this first movement was taken by many as a kind of unspeakable betrayal of his yeah. talents. And I mean, not to speak of how the relationship between Rossellini and Bergman was received stateside. Definitely. Yeah, that it just was complicated hugely everything. controversial. Yeah. I mean, she was denounced on the floor of the Senate. Um, yeah. Said, Out of um, the of Ingrid Bergman will grow a better Hollywood. That's what a senator from Colorado <laughs> said. I mean, to give some back backstory on that, Bergman moved from Hollywood to Italy to work with Rossellini. They fell in love while she was still married. Um, and had three children together, and it was hugely scandalous. And, and what's interesting is, you know, Bergman had come to Hollywood from Stockholm, uh, married to, I think, an orthodontist. He eventually became a brain surgeon, but perhaps at the time he was a, he was a dentist. He had a le he had a less sexy profession at that time. <laughs> but I mean, and the moment that the Bergmans hit the ground in Hollywood. She was cheating on this guy left, right, yeah. and center. Victor Fleming. <laughs> she's Gregory Ingrid Clark. Bergman. And she's, you know, she's not going to, uh, she's not going to be true to the, uh, to the Stockholm orthodontist. I'm just calling him that, who by all accounts is a lovely and very forbearing man. But I mean, this was like a very acceptable kind of, uh, Hollywood hypocrisy, like as long as you let the studio handlers uh, take care of things, you could shack up with Victor Fleming or whatever. Yeah. But God forbid you actually. A foreigner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the partnership between between them was productive, um, as they were partners, you know, on and off screen, or rather mm -hmm. off screen, and then in terms of the films that he directed and she starred in. Um, I was wondering if you what you thought about like the autobiography, autobiographical aspects of the film. Is that something that is necessarily apparent? Is it even worth, you know, going into? Or what? What are your thoughts on this whole like life mirroring, art, aspect? Yeah, it's. A, I don't. I don't see a great deal of it in this film, and I don't think generally of Rossellini as that kind of filmmaker. Which is not to say that there wasn't a lot of him in the films, but mm -hmm. 
I think his curiosity was a great deal. Uh, let's say led him outward generally, because I mean, among other things, these characters are so specifically Northern European. Mm -hmm. I mean, George Sanders is so, yeah. so British yeah. in this movie Distilled. that it's painting. I mean, you know, it's very <laughs> much a film concerning, you know, button down Northern European Protestants going down to Naples and the Amalfi coast and like getting into this rich, uh, like perfumed, weird, deep, sexy, like Catholic death cult world, <laughs> and just totally <laughs> losing their minds because of it. Like, yeah, just, you know, you know, Rossellini always drew this distinction uh, between what he called draped and sewn or tailored cultures, and this is like very much at the center of it. Rossellini, you know. For him, the Mediterranean world, it's all draped. You know, it's, it's classical antiquity. It's people togaed out. He made a wonderful film in India and, in fact, wound up uh, taking an Indian wife at the same time. Yet another married woman. <laughs> the guy had habits, let us say. But, like, found an immediate affinity in the Indian subcontinent. It's like, yeah, this is it's the draped culture. This is mm -hmm. what I'm all about. And this, you know, this dichotomy very much at the center of uh, Journey to Italy, this like draped versus sewn kind of thing. Which definitely comes up like, I mean, pretty explicitly with all the, the kind of travel log elements, right? Where they're interacting with all the different pieces of art and not, nobody really seems, they don't seem to get it. <laughs> so they're just sort of like visiting and checking off the statues, you know? Well, I mean, it, it, it needs to be noted there were a handful of people who were on top of it at the time, including several young French critics who would become filmmakers at Cahiers de Cinema, mm -hmm. uh, Eric Romer, certainly, uh, Jacques Rivette, certainly. Um, Truffaut was a champion of the film. Abs oh, absolutely. Truffaut, who was an assistant at uh, one point to uh, Rossellini before embarking on his own filmmaking career. Um, but though it wasn't much picked up on the time, at the time, for a number of people, this is regarded as being an absolutely pivotal film in the evolution of a kind of European cinematic modernism. Mm -hmm. This is a film that is, and, and maybe its revolutionary aspects are less clear today, but I, you know, I was thinking while rewatching um, about Godard's contempt, uh, in part because Michel Piccoli, uh, one of the film's stars, had recently passed on. And, you know, contempt, though there is some kind of narrative drive in the film, it's essentially a movie about just a couple fighting mm -hmm. <laughs> and tracking all the little convolutions that go on between a couple when the gears aren't meshing. And I mean, what is, you know, Journey to Italy, if not that, I mean, the action in the movie, you know, Rossellini goes on a couple day trips, uh, or rather um, Bergman goes on a couple day trips. Uh, Sanders makes a couple of very half-hearted attempts to get laid. But the basic <laughs> action of the movie is just tracking in minute detail yeah. these little incremental emotional movements that take place between two people yeah. and which can i think be like painfully recognizable the you know moment when people start to drift together and then there's a, a moment of hesitation that mm -hmm is followed by some kind of hasty cutting uh, comment out of habit. And then the feeling of self-recrimination, like, why did I say that? Like, what am I doing? And that's, I mean, that is the action of this movie is yeah. trying to as nearly as possibly um, chart the territory of the sort of emotional life of a couple at a point of extreme unction. 
you know? Yeah, it's it's basically about microaggressions before that was a term. I mean, it's That's, they're just their their passive aggressiveness is is the subject of the film. Yeah, yeah. and it's and it, it years to practice. Yeah, and I should mention, like you know, Sanders, who you know, Sanders was there for hire. Rossellini uh, was really sought out by Bergman. Bergman was very excited by what he was doing much more so than she was excited by the sort of thing she was being offered in Hollywood. So she, she had like a, a very magnetic attraction, not just to the guy, but to a style of working. And as an actress, that was something that she wanted to be a part of yeah. um, as much as anything else. Sanders was, I won't say happily ensconced because he's a miserable bastard, but you know, he was okay with being in Hollywood. And when he came to this movie, uh, he was terribly unhappy on the shoot. He was unhappy because it was a film without a script. There was, you know, not a prepared scenario going in. Rossellini had gone down to Naples initially with the intention of filming an adaptation of a Colette novel duo from, I think, 1934. And suddenly there had been a rights issue with this. So that went out the window and basically cobbled together the barest outline of a scenario, gave five pages of notes to its like line producer, basically saying, you know, I need a couple of docents tour guides. I need, you know, these kind of actors. I need these locations. And that's it. And Sanders thought, you know, this is the most unprofessional, lazy, you know, half-assed thing that I've ever seen. And, you know, belly ached about it constantly then and after the fact. But in, you know, point of fact, there is always like a method to the Rossellini madness. And, you know, the movie is, as we were discussing earlier, it's so tied up in basically following two people in the process of constantly morbidly embarrassing one another. And, you know, Rossellini isolated Sanders in a different hotel than everybody else um, um, was, you know, constantly kind of needling him in order to get precisely the performance that you see. That's like yeah. very prickly, um, very stiff back, um, kind of warding off blows at all uh, times performance. And it's right there, you know, as haphazard as slapdash as the production may seem, it's an incredibly coherent movie right from the beginning, uh, right from like Bergman repulsing from the sight of a little spot of blood on the windshield uh, that, that a mosquito is hit, uh, right from Sanders, um, getting uptight at how fast people are driving, which is fairly infamous around Naples. Um, you know, the characters and the sort of particular qualities of not only the characters, but the actors, <laughs> um, they're enormously evident. At one and the same time, part of Rossellini's approach is to make room at all times for the possibility of the intervention of life, the incursion of life onto the shoot, which is ultimately what the film is. I mean, the climax, the emotional apex of the movie is just this sudden succumbing this, to an explosion of life around these characters yeah. as to if they're going to sustain that moment, impossible to say, but that's where we leave them. Well, that's, um, that was something I really wanted to, to get your read on was that ending. Um, it just, it, it's hard for me to buy it. <laughs> it, just, it seems like it just happens. And I, and you get really swept up in that moment, just like, you know, the characters are being physically swept away, but everything up to that point is so harsh. Um, you know, it, it's hard to, hard to know what's going to happen. Like you said, like, well, there's two things. Really I mean, there's two things. There's two things. It's the question is not like if you buy it, because I mean, for my part, at least I absolutely buy that those two people oh, yeah. in that moment felt that feel way. that way. Yeah. And the emotions As definitely to, translate. Yeah. Yeah. 
as to if 10 minutes after that they're going to feel the same way, you know, it's very open-ended. But, yeah. of course, like the open-endedness is exactly the point of the thing. To go back to the beginning of the movie, like there's a line, I forget precisely what it is, but they're like at a juncture and the you know question is asked, you know, are we taking the left or the right? I'm paraphrasing very badly, but part of the wonder of the movie is it does feel like at any given time, anything could happen. Yeah. And just to like give some instances of uh, the leeway, the room that uh, is made and left for, as I say, these incursions of life, the Pompeii scene, that's, that's docu that's a documentary scene. Yeah. So, you know, Rossellini buttered up uh, one of the head archaeologists at, uh, you know, the Pompeii dig site, did not know in advance that there would be an opportunity to observe this plaster casting and unearthing. Wow. But having, you know, sufficiently sucked up to this guy, uh, was told <laughs> on the morning of, and, you know, because the shooting schedule is so lax, yeah. um, they're able to kind of drop Sorry, everything man. and do that is told on the morning of, Hey, we found, uh, you know, a body, but, and this is extraordinary, but nevertheless true. And like, uh, an absolute miracle then to go and witness this scene. And it is a man and a woman, uh, together at the moment of death. Yeah. Um, moreover in that final scene where there's that huge surge, um, that was a captured miracle, if you want to receive it as such, which is to say an old man just dropped his crutches and started dancing around. And Rossellini, oddly, was up on a crane at the time and was able to catch this. Huh. So, I mean, there are more than a couple instances where, by virtue of having such a freewheeling approach, Rossellini allows room for these somewhat miraculous moments to occur. Yeah. So what seems to George Sanders at the time is just, you know, Italian lassitude because George <laughs> Sanders is exactly the guy he appears to be in yeah. this. Um, you know, again, there is, there is a method. Yeah. Well, so we're kind of, we're really pushing on time. I've got a handful of questions from our audience. I wanted to shoot out at you quick. Okay. One of them is actually about the movie. The other two are sort of more about our previous conversation. Uh, Joseph asks uh, what you thought about the film's presentation of religion. Well, yeah, here's the thing. And this kind of dovetails with your point. Rossellini to hear Rossellini tell it was uh, an atheist, um, a non-believer. Nevertheless, this film, and if one watches Stromboli, and really more than a couple, um, they revolve around moments uh, that are something like, you know, moments of revelation, uh, and whatever his personal beliefs were, and I think they fluctuated somewhat through the years. In fact, I know they fluctuated somewhat through the years. Uh, you know, Rossellini was Italian Catholic and very much steeped in that culture. So if what's occurring at the end of Journey to Italy isn't divine revelation per se, it's secular version of that as Rossellini understands it. I mean, however, again, whatever his personal beliefs may be that like, you know, Saul of Tarsus scales falling from the eye thing mm. has left a deep imprint on him. And I think at this period, um, the timeline's a little uncertain to me, but he had had a um, young son die at one point. Uh, I think had slid toward the church a little bit, uh, but I, 
I don't have my years exactly right. What I do know is, and this kind of returns to your point, the way that he would talk about particularly the ending of this movie was different in the mid sixties than it was around this time. Yeah. And it's also like, you know, like so many filmmakers, Rossellini's a people pleaser. So, you know, if a French existentialist journalist comes up and says, well, I bet you don't really believe in all that God bullshit. He's going to go, no, of course not. <laughs> yeah. um, as opposed to, you know, the Vatican newspaper or something like that. Um, but yeah, very round roundabout way. Um, I think even if you're not going to accept that this is the presentation of a miracle at uh, face value, you know, Rossellini is a guy who's, again, totally, totally steeped in this tradition and has found a way to kind of airlift miracles out of the church and find his own secular version of miracles. In fact, the last movie he ever made, ever completed, something called Il Messiah, which is the story of the life of Christ. And it's, you know, it's the, uh, it's the gospels precisely, but with everything but the miracles. So it's just like a totally secularized life of Christ. I mean, Europa 51 situates Ingrid Bergman as a saint, like pretty literally. Yeah. 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 I mean, any way you slice it, the influence of Catholicism was not small on Roberto Rossellini or really any Italian filmmaker of his generation. <laughs> so we had a, a question kind of early on from Dan um, talking, I, I think the, uh, the 480p pre-code <laughs> film on <laughs> Russian website. Uh, his, his question is a little long, I'll have to, to paraphrase it, but what, what he's saying is, if you could, would you trade our current situation where you can watch almost anything you want, but often in subpar conditions, um, for having that, you know, ultimate experience of film watching, you know, a celluloid print in a, in a large theater, but with less available choice? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um... That is a tough one. Before you answer, Nick, I just want to say, speaking of divine intervention, cat, by the way, Walter speaking has made of an divine opinion. intervention. Yes. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go on. Um. Yeah, I, there are a lot of aspects to the way films can be accessed now that. I have a hard time knocking, not least because it does decentralize things a little bit, or it makes things at least somewhat easier for people who are not in the like beating heart of a large urban center. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, for the last several years have done a critics workshop um, in Belgium and either last year or year before last, I had a student who's from a village in the west of Ireland. And he's like, you know, I there's no way I could be here. I could have any of the knowledge that I now have without downloading, without, you know, without uh, ripping files left and right. And, you know, I absolutely am not going to knock that. And in some ways... Um, it, it creates, um, the opportunity for folks far and wide to participate in film culture who might not otherwise have those opportunities. And that's mm -hmm. fantastic at one and the same time. Um, I really have a great deal of perhaps misplaced um, I won't say nostalgia because I only I only really experienced a little of it firsthand but like uh, I don't see why I don't see why it would have to be a one or the other you know because historically in this country and other countries you've been able to see um, fairly robust 
regional film scenes by way of campus film societies, yeah. by way now, thankfully some of it's coming back, by way now of micro cinemas, uh, you know, screening clubs, whatever it may be. Mini micro cinema, oh, yeah. RIP. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be back in some iteration, we hope. Um, but yeah, total cop out answer, but uh, like, I, I don't I don't see how or why both can't be on some level yeah. possible. Yeah. Now you know, relative ease is more of the question. Yeah, yeah, like uh, clusters of like cultural capital are always going to be there. Like mm -hmm. you know, Lima, Ohio is never going to like boast a four screen art house <laughs> playing like Straub Huye. That's pretty mm -hmm. unlikely but you know i feel like i feel like we've lost a lot of our like film cultural infrastructure in this country in the last you know <laughs> along with a few other things yeah. that i can think of yeah. um but you know really in my lifetime yeah. um but drive-ins are gonna make a comeback right nick <laughs> yeah you know sure <laughs> <laughs> for this summer anyway yeah, this is one of these like stopgap, like ray of hope things that yeah. I, I can never get too chuffed about. It's like, don't worry, you can see Trolls Two on its thirty-sixth uh, oh. week. Trolls, tro oh, the... I, I was thinking Troll Two. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was thinking Troll Two. Oh, as yeah. well. <laughs> Superior. <laughs> troll I mean, that, yeah, that would be exciting. Well, be so exciting for sure. maybe to to close us out, Henry had asked. Uh, you know, we talk Cincinnati movies and, and clearly Homebodies is the undisputed most Cincinnati movie. Uh, can, do you have a recommendation for a Midwestern movie? Is there a movie that captures the Midwestern experience? Not a Midwestern experience. Let me, let me think on that. Let me think on that. My go-tos are always uh, Minnelli's Meet Me in St. Louis and uh, Wells's um, Magnificent Ambersons. Mm -hmm. um, the former, of course, in a uh, St. Louis that's a hundred percent, you know, freed unit MGM lot confection. But this, you know, absolutely uh, gorgeously nostalgicized fantasy version of the Middle West at the turn of the last century. And, you know, the premise of it is uh, you know, musical film, uh, Judy Garland, uh, the source of Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, etc. cetera. But uh, the like main engine of the plot is there is a uh, successful Midwestern uh, family in St. Louis who uh, are faced with the prospect when the patriarch gets a job in New York City uh, of moving away from St. Louis. And you know, initially uh, there's a sort of excitement, but this excitement mellows into just total terror. And the sort of premise <laughs> of the movie is like leaving St. Louis to go to New York is the worst thing that could possibly <laughs> happen to, to anyone. Um, and then, I'm also enormously fond of Wells's Magnificent Amberson, which Ambersons, which again is this middle middle Western golden age, like mm -hmm. this turn of the last century moment when there is like this enormous concentration of uh, you know wealth um, and uh, and just a, a really lovely movie. Again, not unlike Homebodies. This is probably the first time the comparison <laughs> has been made. But like a movie that has a great deal to say about how cities grow and change and why they look like they do today. Mm -hmm. um, the source being a novel by uh, Indianapolis's Booth Tarkington. Again, these are all like period pieces. So I guess for whatever reason, my like cinematic Midwest is centered around like <laughs> the long 1905. <laughs> and, and, you know, and maybe that's also like a particularly Midwestern thing is you have this like conception of a, a glowing golden age. And yeah. then you have like home bodies, the like era <laughs> of decline and crumbling. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, th I'll throw those out. No, oh, that's excellent. Well, thank you so much, Nick. Yeah, this has been pleasure. awesome. Really appreciate you taking the time. 
Uh, oh. And thank you to obviously everybody else who's out there watching and, and stayed with us this week. If you're enjoying these discussions, uh, please let us know in the comments uh, by or liking this post. We're going to be back uh, Tuesday, June 9th with UC professor Stanley Corkin, who's going to be discussing Robert Mitchum's neo-noir thriller, The Friends of Eddie Coyle, uh, which is also available to stream on Canopy through the library. We'll have the link to that in the post. We'll be doing promos shortly. Uh, For all updates and more info about Cincinnati Library Film Club, we've got a link, which I believe will be below, uh, sinlib.org slash filmclublive. So again, thank you very much, and we will see you next time.